April 24th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Judges chapter 19 from the Old Testament. In those days, Israel had no king. There was a Levite living temporarily in the remote region of the Ephraimite hill country. He acquired a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. However, she got angry at him and went home to her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah. When she had been there four months, her husband came after her, hoping he could convince her to return. He brought with him his servant and a pair of donkeys. When she brought him into her father's house and the girl's father saw him, he greeted him warmly. His father-in-law, the girl's father, persuaded him to stay with him for three days, and they ate and drank together and spent the night there. On the fourth day, they woke up early, and the Levite got ready to leave. But the girl's father said to his son-in-law, Have a bite to eat for some energy, then you can go. So the two of them sat down and had a meal together. Then the girl's father said to the man, Why not stay another night and have a good time? When the man got ready to leave, his father-in-law convinced him to stay another night. He woke up early in the morning on the fifth day so he could leave. But the girl's father said, Get some energy, wait until later in the day to leave. So they ate a meal together. When the man got ready to leave with his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, Look, the day is almost over. Stay another night. Since the day is over, stay another night here and have a good time. You can get up early tomorrow and start your trip home. But the man did not want to stay another night. He left and traveled as far as Jebus, that is, Jerusalem. He had with him a pair of saddled donkeys and his concubine. When they got near Jebus, it was getting quite late, and the servant said to his master, Come on, let's stop at this Jebusite city and spend the night in it. But his master said to him, We should not stop at a foreign city where non-Israelites live. We will travel on to Gibeah. He said to his servant, Come on, we will go into one of the other towns and spend the night in Gibeah or Ramah. So they traveled on and the sun went down when they were near Gibeah in the territory of Benjamin. They stopped there and decided to spend the night in Gibeah. They came into the city and sat down in the town square, but no one invited them to spend the night. But then an old man passed by, returning at the end of the day from his work in the field. The man was from the Ephraimite hill country. He was living temporarily in Gibeah. The residents of the town were Benjaminites. When he looked up and saw the traveler in the town square, the old man said, Where are you heading? Where do you come from? The Levite said to him, We are traveling from Bethlehem in Judah to the remote region of the Ephraimite hill country. That's where I'm from. I had business in Bethlehem in Judah, but now I'm heading home. But no one has invited me into their home. We have enough straw and grain for our donkeys, and there's enough food and wine for me, your female servant, and the young man who is with your servants. We lack nothing. The old man said, Everything is just fine. I will take care of all your needs. But don't spend the night in the town square. So he brought him to his house and fed the donkeys. They washed their feet and had a meal. They were having a good time. When suddenly some men of the city, some good-for-nothing, surrounded the house and kept beating on the door. They said to the old man who owned the house, Send out the man who came to visit you so we can have sex with him. The man who owned the house went outside and said to them, No, my brothers, don't do this wicked thing. After all, this man is a guest in my house. Don't do such a disgraceful thing. Here are my virgin daughter and my guest concubine. I will send them out, and you can abuse them and do to them whatever you like. But don't do such a disgraceful thing to this man. The men refused to listen to him, so the Levite grabbed his concubine and made her go outside. They raped her and abused her all night long until morning. They let her go at dawn. The woman arrived back at daybreak and was sprawled out on the doorstep of the house where her master was staying until it became light. When her master got up in the morning, opened the doors of the house, and went outside to start on his journey, there was the woman, his concubine, sprawled out on the doorstep of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, Get up, let's leave. But there was no response. 
He put her on the donkey and went home. When he got home, he took a knife, grabbed his concubine, and carved her up into 12 pieces. Then he sent the pieces throughout Israel. Everyone who saw the sight said nothing like this has happened or been witnessed during the entire time since the Israelites left the land of Egypt. Take careful note of it. Discuss it and speak. God, this has to be one of the harder chapters to record in the Bible. Rape and murder, and we're about to get into civil war. But we know why. Because at the beginning of the chapter, it said, In those days, Israel had no king. They had no king of the type that we think of, but they also didn't have you. We're back to Sodom and Gomorrah times where people had turned so far away from your teaching. Israel had turned so far away from your teaching that we have another Sodom instant incident on our hands. We even see the people in the story reacting the same way as that story in Sodom. I'm always a little bit baffled when I read the story about this man who would go to great lengths to bring back this woman in his life, yet so callously throw her out to these men. And in the morning, not even act surprised when he finds her dead and just throws her on top of his donkey. Or, or the man who seems kind initially that's going to let them stay there for the night, but he's willing to throw out his daughter to these, to these men. I, I think sometimes we're too used to Hollywood's version of things, that there has to be a clear-cut good guy and there has to be a clear-cut bad guy. Um, and we have the clear-cut bad guys who are raping and end up killing this, this woman. But we want her husband, and we want the gentleman who gave them housing. We want them to be good people. We don't want them to be callous, and we don't want them to be the bad guys, yet, yet they are right along with it. And then how ironic at the end that he cuts her up into 12 pieces to send to the 12 tribes of Israel to let them have judgment over what happened. Doesn't he realize he's going to be part of that judgment? <laughs> I don't know. It's a hard story to hear. I, I think mostly once once we get past the, the horribleness of what has happened in the story, we can start to see ourselves in those situations where, where we righteously make choices and then we turn right around and and choose sin and, and choose Satan's agenda. We we do know that for you, God, that some sin is punishment for sin in the first place. And that that thought in the story gets a little bit overwhelming that sin upon sin upon sin that we've just fallen into a pit and kind of going back to the original words of how this chapter started in those days Israel had no king that there is only one way out of this pit there is only one way to solve this situation and that's for you to be our king God it's for you to sit on the throne of our heart today tomorrow for the rest of our life that all of our choices come through that decision it's so odd to me when people say sin happens Yet we choose the good things in life, and that's not true. We, ch we choose sin just as much as we choose to put you on the throne of our heart. God, let this story settle into our hearts. Let us realize the hypocr hypocrisy of our own life. Realize that without you as our king, we are going to fall into that pit. Without you as our king, we're going to be destroyed. Our lives are going to be sin after sin after sin, filled with drama and pain, and most of all, no peace. God, thank you so much. So 
so much for your grace. Thank you so much for your mercy. Most of all, thank you for your forgiveness. I love you. In your son's name I pray. Amen.